Hello and welcome to the 14th episode of Delving Into Academics. If you don't know what this podcast is about, it's where various researchers from physics, chemistry and biology are interviewed about what they're currently working on and their life as an academic. In this episode, Dr Richard Blythe tells us about his research into modelling and understanding complex far from equilibrium systems and how they can relate to biology and linguistics. I hope you enjoy this episode. here with Dr. Richard Blythe. He started out doing a Master's of Science at the University of Bristol, completing that in 1998. He then moved on to do a PhD at the University of Edinburgh. He then was a postdoctorate research fellow at the University of Manchester from 2001 to 2004. He then went on to become a research fellow again at the University of Edinburgh in 2004 and a research fellow slash lecturer in 2007. He then was a full-time lecturer in 2012 and became a reader in 2014. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, no problem. So start out with the main question. What are you currently researching? What am I currently researching? It's a really good question because we've just got to the end of the semester, so I don't have time to get back to these things. And actually, I'm working right now on a paper that was started as part of an undergraduate MPhys project. And it was actually about learning words, because I've been working with some linguists for a while and psychologists, and we've been trying to apply techniques from statistical physics to understanding questions about language. And he did some really good work on memory. So we uh, had a model of of word learning, but it was a bit rubbish because it just assumed people could remember forever. So he incorporated some stuff about memory in there, built up a really good model. And I've just been trying to figure out exactly what this model does and, and, and write a paper about it. So that's what I've been working on right, right at the moment. Wow, that sounds so interesting. So how does statistical physics work in with linguistics? Yeah, that is a really good question. So so I always say, I mean, so my stock answer is that statistical mechanics tries to uh, describe the patterns in, in the world around us by appealing to the interactions between the component parts. And you can basically apply that to anything. So so the big challenge in, in physics right now is how to go beyond equilibrium systems. It's what you learn about in junior honours, thermal physics. And then when you go beyond that, you want to talk about non-equilibrium systems, which is where you have stuff that's flowing or moving about in some way that dissipates energy. And when you've got that, then basically you can start to talk about anything. So we can sort of model the process of, of learning by, you know, you're being exposed to some collection of words and you don't know what they mean. So there's a lot of uncertainty in there. Statistical physics talks all about probability distributions, so we kind of know how to deal with that. And the thing where we really get involved is because um, what StatMec does is it allows you to talk about big systems. So in physics, it's like you know, Avogadro's number, which is like 10 to the 23 or 6, I can never remember. But, you know, so so psychologists, for example, can set up fairly simple models. It can work for up to about 100 words. But if you want to say, well, we learn about 60,000 over our lifetime. So if you want to scale up to that level, then you need to start putting in you know, so the techniques of statistical mechanics and things like that. So we can make predictions like how many words can you learn after this amount of time, if you can remember things for this long and stuff like that, and then try and compare those with what people measure experimentally. And so what types of applications does this have in linguistic research? Right, it's mostly about testing sort of models. So like I just said, that it's quite easy to come up with a verbal argument about how how the world works. And that's, of course, where science generally starts. You say, well, you know, I think, uh, you know, there's this force of gravity or something that's putting things down. But then what you need to do is you need to kind of test whether that really works quantitatively. And actually, this is not something, you know, when I collaborate with people in these other fields, they always look at me like a bit sort of like, but but, but why do you want to do that? And it's like, well, you know, if you if your model predicts that it takes the age of the universe to learn a thousand words, then there's something wrong with your model, right? You know, if we can, you know, we can argue about factors of two and stuff because they're going to be wrong, in it, you know. But if your, if your verbal argument fundamentally predicts like a, a, a totally incorrect time scale, which sometimes happens in, in these model systems, then we've got some more thinking to do about, about how this process works. So hopefully that's, 
that's what I think I contribute. Whether that contribution is is particularly well received is is a is a completely different question. Yeah, and so what aspects of statistical physics really strengthen then this study into linguistics? Because for me, looking at language and the study of linguistics is kind of it's very different to studying statistical physics. It's, physics seems a bit more rigid, whereas linguistics seems a bit less rigid, I guess. I, I understand what you're saying. I mean, I think it depends on which bit that you look at, because I mean, obviously it's, it's a very well-developed discipline in its own right, and people do know how to formulate sort of good research questions and things like that. So the way that I got into it is actually during my time in Manchester, you know, I bumped into a linguist by accident, who was interested in, in modelling. So we had a workshop where some modelling type people and, and other people got together. And, and what he said was very, very interesting. And when we first spoke to him, you know, I came with, with, with pretty much, you know, the what you were just saying, that how can we really, how can we really do something useful here? But it turned out that he was already thinking in quite sort of quantitative ways and about fairly well controlled kind of problems in, in some way. So the place where we started actually was in something called sociolinguistic variation, which sounds really complicated, but all it means is is that people have different ways of saying the same thing. And that can vary according to where you live in the country, whether you're male or female, and a whole bunch of other um, variables. And so what they have is some data which sort of says things like, you know, over time, you know, you can look at what fraction of people are saying this thing, what fraction of people are saying that thing, and quite often you see sort of repeatable patterns. So... Having said that, I'm struggling to think of one, but um, well, one is that apparently uh, women tend to lead men in a change. So if you've got a change that's going through, yeah. then for lots of different changes, it tends to be uh, that the women who are doing it first and then the men follow. And that's a sort of repeatable effect, which I don't think we have a good explanation for as yet. Another phenomenon is that um, there's this thing called the adolescent peak, which is, so if instead of looking at gender, if you look at age, then what you find is so if, if there's a change that's happening because young people don't sound like old people right and maybe there's some bias that we say well as we you know we don't want to identify with people who are 50 years older than, than us so we talk in a different way and it's adolescents tend to be the most different to the older people for reasons that you kind of might understand that you know young child will speak like their parents but then they detect or the theory is is that they detect that there's a change happening and so older people are doing this old sounding thing. Your parents, for example, are maybe a bit further forward. So what you do is you then overshoot to just say, you know, somehow you're doing some sort of extrapolation saying, you know, if they sometimes say this thing, well, I'm going to say it even more to make me sound even more kind of young and modern. And so that, so what that means is that when you look at a plot of the diff, how much people are doing things by age category, then you get a peak at where teenagers are because they're the ones who are doing it the most. And again, that's a repeatable phenom- phenomenon over lots of things. So that's kind of to illustrate that, like I said, you know, it's all about patterns and structures in the world around us. So if you keep, you know, repeatedly observing patterns, then, you know, you've got a chance to actually try and work out what the ingredients are that can generate those patterns. And that's sort of what we do as physicists, right? You know, we, whether it's sort of an experimental system or some other more natural observation about the world, we can sit down and go, well, we think these are the relevant things put those together does it work yes no if it does that's great it doesn't necessarily mean that it's working that way but it could work that way and if it doesn't as I said before then you really have got some some thinking to do about what's missing and refine your your models as to how the world works yeah no that sounds really interesting especially how you've been able to connect repeated patterns in the way people speak and talk over the years it's quite cool how it can link all together so I know you've just start, said that you've only just started uh, your research back up as the semester has ended but what kinds of things are you finding what are the results from the types of research in this area that's another very good question and it's very hard to sort of summarize uh, in a word so I mean I work in in various different areas so so one area is in more traditional statistical mechanics um, more applied to as I said out of equilibrium systems so things in, in biology in particular, sort of a good source of out of equilibrium behaviour because, you know, we consume energy and generate heat and work and all the rest of it. So this kind of irreversible flow of energy through all organisms. And what do we find from that? So what we find is is that you can create essentially a whole new set of states of matter 
out of this so i mean they have you know you can recognize them as being some form of solid liquid and gas and, and, and all the rest of it but they tend to have sort of unique properties so one thing that a lot of people on this corridor have got quite interested in recently is a phenomenon whereby so you have organisms like bacteria and stuff they consume energy to move and even though i mean if they were dead they would just repel each other so you just have usual kind of repulsion of particles from each other you know electromagnetic repulsion but when they're alive that repulsion can turn into an attraction and just p purely through physical effect it's not like even before you put in things like sensing and all the rest of it that just just because of the way that they move and it's a way that consumes energy and is irreversible rather than reversible means that they can end up attracting each other rather than repelling each other so one of the things that i've been working on is sort of simple models of those kind of processes to kind of really understand you know, what is it when we break the microscopic rules of reversibility is it that causes these kind of clustering and, and attraction to, to occur and there's a whole load of other things in that sort of area about phase transitions and other out of equilibrium phenomena that, that, that we've learned about on the language side i think it's mostly what i said before i mean the main thing is is trying to do this thing of scaling from the individual to the population and seeing if things work um, I think the headline finding if there is one is that quite repeatedly it turns out to be quite difficult to reproduce what you actually see and even when we when we simplify our picture of reality to, you know so that we can work with it mathematically so again another project I've been looking at is about grammatical change over historical periods in lots of different places and the bottom line is is that pretty much any theory that you write down predicts that there will be a, a big impact to the size of the population on the rate of change and all of the data that we have available to us suggests that there's very very limited effect of population size so <laughs> again it's like how do we get that and it's quite remarkable that um, you know, very large and quite dispersed populations can all coordinate on the same thing over remarkably short periods of time so how do they do that and that's uh, a question that we're still trying to answer but but in some ways getting to the point where you know what the question is is kind of a result in its own right because you know before you started it's like well you know we don't know anything about what's going on here so let's try and understand this a bit and we understand things well enough to know that oh what's really interesting about this the system is that things change quickly and in a way that doesn't depend very much on population size which is kind of weird yeah that sounds so cool and it's kind of cool how this can connect with so many different aspects of as you said you're just studying biology and you know microorganisms and how they interact but then also the language side and the probably more social impacts there coming to the more biological side and with microorganisms and such how can non-equilibrium systems kind of play a role there? I know you mentioned about how they attract one another, but then is there, can this be applied elsewhere in biology or is there other aspects that the statistical physics that you're studying be applied? That, I mean, <laughs> I mean, that question, I think, could be the topic of at least a PhD thesis, if not, uh, you know, an entire research programme. At the moment, I mean, the current state of play in, in the field, so there, you know, there's quite a lot of people working in this area. It's a, a big growth industry in, in this area of physics. Uh, but it is being done in a very sort of piecemeal kind of way at the moment, that each each problem is being looked at in a fairly kind of isolated kind of way, and not, not deliberately so, just, just of the nature of the way that things work, because in order to start working in, in an area like that, you have to hook up with a biologist, um, or if you're working in another area, you know, the relevant expert. And so at the moment, there's, there's sort of quite a lot of model building that is fairly bespoke to the specific applications that people are working on. So a lot of people, like I said, around here are, are interested in these microbial things but different aspects of it some people like looking at the uh, sort of the the ecology aspect of it so they form populations and get many different species and what those species interactions do other people are interested in things like you know, the shapes of the colonies that grow mechanics of that there's a whole different bunch of ways of, of looking at these problems and they have different applications so some of it's relevant to antimicrobial resistance for example some of it's um, relevant to things like biofilm formation so you get um, you know sort of clusters of bacteria sticking they for example they stick to the bottom of boats and make it hard for boats to actually sail and this kind of wastes a lot of energy and so Rosalind Allen uh, she works on, on that sort of thing so but at the moment it, it is you'll be coming in with 
you know a set of a set of problems a space that you can work in with some expert input from the outside so we haven't yet got to the point where we have anything that's starting to look like a, a unified theory for this stuff we were sort of at the, the stage before that which is kind of why it's kind of you know a nice place to be because obviously a lot of physics is very well developed you know it's unlikely you're going to do something new in sort of newtonian mechanics you know in the 21st century right but you know but we are at the point where you know uh, you know imagine being you know an astronomer pre pre newton and galileo and things you know you're kind of like well you've just got all these patterns that you're observing and you're trying to work out where they're coming from and you've maybe got different models for different um different aspects of what you're observing and we're kind of at that that stage at the moment and 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 it's diff- you know it's quite hard because there's so many different ways to go out of equilibrium that we don't even know sort of theoretically actually if there's if there's that many kind of grand unified ways of of, of breaking the equilibrium conditions or, or classes of things that you can say oh yes actually all this set of problems are the same effectively they just look different but actually they're the same because that's the kind of thing that a physicist is, is trained to do is to try and put lots of things in as many things into the same box as possible and basically go, yeah these are all the same but we're not there yet and you know in biology of course there's a huge field had you know many people working on it for, for a very long time so it'll probably be quite a long time before we we reach the point where we can you know get some sort of synthesis but but yeah but like i said you know this is the kind of thing that, that, that people are aiming for in, in the long term yeah and it sounds like a really exciting point to be at almost yeah at i the think beginning, so and you're still discovering lots about it and it seems quite new but also very it seems to be developing quite quickly that is that is definitely true i mean when i started my phd which was in the field of non-equilibrium stat mech you know, a, a few people talked about biological applications, but they were, they were, you know, it was just something to write in the introduction of the paper, you know, I would say, as, as a sort of a inspiration or motivation to, to study some bit of mathematics, basically. And I remember actually the first conference I went to, I got a little bit disillusioned, or confused at least, that there were so many different models being talked about, and they all seemed quite abstract, and there were a few kind of unifying themes, basically the situation I just, just described. But actually what's changed since then is that the applications have become more real, I would say, and people really are now applying these to real systems. And of course, there's a big sort of experimental tradition to tap into there. So rather than it more being, well, let's just cook up some way of going out of equilibrium and see what happens, it's now more like, okay, well, we've got this this, this thing happening in biology. We want to understand that. Here's our model of it. Oh, this is what happens. We can test that experimentally, show that it works, and then sort of start to think more about these these broader questions of how, how different things are related to each other. So yeah, so I would say that right now is is yeah, it certainly the the general atmosphere say of a conference has changed quite a lot quite a lot. There's a lot of excitement uh, in the field. Wow, that sounds so cool. And I know well from what I read researching for this episode, that apparently out of equilibrium systems they're quite hard to study, and there's not a complete unified theory as you said. So what makes out of equilibrium systems so difficult to research and get to this complete theory and maybe do you think now well not focusing but looking into the applications of this do you think that might make mean we could get closer to a theory or do you think it will help in any way possibly so to answer your first question I mean, people who have done the junior honours statistical mechanics course, which I realise won't be everybody who's listening to this, but the amazing thing that happens when you're at equilibrium is that you can basically forget about dynamics. So in principle, what you do is you'd, you'd start off if you're thinking about a classical system of, uh, you know, say, the ideal gas. Think, well, OK, if, you're, if you only know first year physics, then what would you do? Well, I'd sit down and write down Newton's equations for the ideal gas, which, you know, F equals MA, basically. But the trouble is when you've got 10 to the 20, whatever it was, particles, then, you know, that's a lot of writing. And and to, to solve those dynamic equations is, is just, just not feasible, even on a computer. But it turns out that, yeah, there's a trick that you don't really need to do that, because what happens is the system organises in, into the state of uh, greatest uncertainty. It's a maximum entropy state. And then lots of magic happens there, where you can just talk about um, distributions and just say, well, we can talk about the probability that it's in any given configuration. And there's a fundamental postulate that basically says if you have an isolated system, it's equilibrium, then um, every state you can be in is the same probability. Okay, so that's kind of the spoiler alert for third year stat mech. And then from that, you can basically derive everything. So you can get like the ideal gas law after four or five lines of algebra, things like that. So what makes non-equilibrium hard? Well, it's because you can't make that assumption anymore. 
Okay, you can't just say every configuration is equally likely, which means the only thing we know is that every configuration isn't equally likely. But they can be unalike in lots of different ways, and we don't know which way is the right way or the most appropriate way for any um, given system. So some people have tried to attack this problem from a theoretical point of view by trying to apply some of the ideas. So there's a more kind of abstract theory based on information that will, will get you the result that I just told you about. So you can try applying that to some, you can say, okay, well, if I maybe have like a flux of energy at the boundaries or something, then, then maybe I can work out what the distribution is. It becomes very difficult to actually do any calculations or, or test it because you end up with some horrible equations that are hard to solve. And also we wouldn't really know what experiment to do to, to test it. So to come to your second question, then actually maybe, yeah, kind of starting from the point of systems that we can experiment on and do have some control over, and working out how they behave, then maybe this this will help us narrow down the space of, of ways of going out of equilibrium. Maybe there's only really kind of half a dozen ways, fundamentally different ways of doing it or something like that. Um, but maybe there's millions, who knows? Yeah, well, that sounds very cool, very exciting. And the possibilities to kind of develop that and maybe, who knows, in the future, come to a unified theory through applying this, to different systems that we know about as you said this sounds very exciting there seems to be a lot of possibilities so where do you think your research could potentially develop in the future you mentioned the biological application research and also the linguistic research. yeah so there's an idea actually which is used in physics in sort of more equilibrium type physics which people are exploring in the biological context a bit and I think there's scope to apply on the linguistic side as well and it's it's about trying to so how can we put it so it's referred to it as the inverse problem so so but to understand the inverse problem you have to know what the forward problem is first so the forward problem is is uh, basically what I described that you set up the rules and see what the system does and then compare that with with what actually happens and try and use that as a tool to work out if if your modeling is is reasonable or not so the inverse problem is actually starting from the other side, which say, well, we've, we've got the natural world around us and this is how it behaves and we can make all these measurements. Can we actually infer the model out of the data using sort of more like data science-y kind of uh, techniques and things like that? And so the sort of classical equilibrium physics example of this is that you can... So if you want to know how, say, a particle responds to a force, then one way you can do that is by forcing it. Okay, and seeing how it responds. It's kind of the obvious way. The other way it turns out you can do it is you can just watch it. Okay, in so if you have say um, a particle sitting in a fluid, you can just watch it bounce around in the fluid, and by by collecting like all its sort of microscopic movements, you can actually work out how it would respond to a force because there's some sort of symmetry that that relates these things. And so the idea that you can essentially observe something passively, and understand how it would respond to changes that you might make if you were to do an experiment on it quite an interesting one and sort of fits into the space of kind of working out you know what is the behavior of this system based on just our observations of it rather than sort of experimenting on it and this is actually I mean you know in, in biology and linguistics and things like that this could be really useful because it actually can be quite difficult to to experiment I mean okay you can, you can do you know experimental models in biology well I say quite easy I'm not a biologist so I, 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 I can say that uh, I'm sure it's incredibly difficult but, you know they have huge labs staffed with hundreds of people to do it so it must be hard but the point is is you can go into the lab again and set up your you know your, your cell system or your you know your, your model or whatever it is and you can and you can manipulate it you can give it a higher dose of antibiotic or, or whatever like that and see how it responds but actually you know a lot of what we're interested in is, is what happens in the real world so it'd be you know really quite interesting if we could look at real world natural systems without touching them you know, in the wild how they behave and then use that information to back out you know oh, well this is you know if we were to change the environmental conditions like this this is how it would change and we can make that prediction from you know observing it in the in, in the original system just like we can do with a with a physical system that would be really cool and really helpful because then you could learn a lot more about your systems than you know because obviously it's in, a, in a lab you can only do things over short amounts of time and with you know small systems but you know you could get into the wild and just just look at stuff and, and try and um, infer stuff from it so that's that's kind of what i'd like to do whether i'll ever manage to do that before retiring is is another question but but yeah but that, that that's the goal anyway yeah, it sounds really cool that you'd be able to look at a real world system because i know that's sometimes the difficulty and from what i've heard in biology um, 
again, I'm not a biologist either, so I'm not too sure, but like they have, they'll do tests in the lab, but whether it works in real life or not, that's the real test. So it would be real cool to be able to go out into the real world and observe, and then from that, get like models and data. So, mm, yeah. Yeah, that sounds super exciting. And you sound really passionate and into what you're researching. And so, like, what is it about being a researcher that you really enjoy, and what about studying these types of systems is it that you really enjoy? There, there are so many things that it's kind of difficult to give an immediate answer. So one of them is is a continuation of what it was that actually got me into physics in the first place. Because when I was um, studying at school, I didn't really know what I wanted to do afterwards. And I just found physics really difficult. <laughs> and it sounds like a very strange reason to want to do it, but I found it difficult. But I found that, you know, if I persevered hard enough, I could eventually get an answer to the question that had been set. And when I did, I just thought, oh, wow, that's, you know, kind of really amazing. And also it sort of surprised me, you know, when I first learned about mechanics, for example, that, oh, right, you can actually develop a sort of a fundamental rule that then can make lots of predictions for a whole load of different things rather than basically having to treat each one like I talked about re- uh, before about okay well you know maybe like a cannonball works this way but a car would work that way or you know a skier would work you know have a completely different set of rules that apply to it and it's actually no, no 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 they're all kind of manifestations of the same thing but you just have to sort of methodically work through and and and, and see that all through so that really appealed to me so like the ability to sort of keep doing that 20 whatever it is years later is is great and and yeah and you know you do have quite a lot of freedom in this in this job so you, know, you can pursue questions because you think they're interesting so I mean I think if you are working for example in a you know, an industrial lab then obviously there always or usually be sort of a product motivation behind it whereas in a university environment you know you have the luxury of it being like well actually it's just you know how, how do languages change and we're not asked, necessarily answering that question because we seek to apply the knowledge in some way, although maybe we could, and that would be great. But it's actually because because we just don't know, and we want to know, right? And that, that's kind of you know what we've been doing for hundreds of years. So so, and there's a lot of fun in that as well. But there's a whole bunch of other things. I mean, you know, I would say you know a lot of it is about again being in a university environment, though. So you have a constant influx of of young people, which you know keeps things fresh, and lots of people coming in always with kind of new ideas and. Uh, you know, so that, that creates a very sort of pleasurable environment to be in. So yeah, so lots of things basically. Yeah, exactly. And it sounds that I have kind of a similar interest because of the reasons that you say, you know, like the fact that everything can be applied to fundamental principles if you persevere, then you can get to an answer which and as you say, like it's hard but the reward is kind of worth it almost as well, which is really cool. So for undergraduates coming in and maybe thinking about going on to do research, maybe then just not sure on what they want to do, but they're kind of enjoying physics at the moment. What kind of advice would you have for them? Yeah, that's another excellent question. <laughs> it's actually quite difficult because I mean I am aware that the landscape has changed quite a lot in the time that you know, that I was an undergraduate student. So these days it's very common for students to have done some form of you know, summer project or internship whereas you know back in my day I mean your summer you just went off and had fun right and I'm not saying that you know doing an internship <laughs> wouldn't be fun but you, you know like have some downtime for physics because you are allowed to do something else right and so I would hate to see it sort of become a necessity that people felt that they had to do that because I feel like and of course some people can't you know they might need to get a job over the summer or something but you know there are other ways I guess to sort of stay stay connected to physics I mean I would say just just keep at it it's probably not a great idea to be too fixed in your ideas about what you want to do, I think, because a lot of it is sort of serendipitous. So like I talked about earlier, so the whole, you know, I had no idea that I'd end up getting into these language problems, OK, back when I was even doing my first postdoc. So I applied to do a fellowship in Manchester, like you said, and I was lucky it got funded. So I went down and initially it was to work with people who had worked on a whole other area of physics, um, glasses and slow dynamics and all that kind of stuff. But I, as I said, I kind of bumped into somebody else in that time and it just kick-started a whole bunch of things that I wasn't expecting and never expected to really get into. And nothing that I did in my undergraduate studies, for example, no, equipped me, I, you know, I didn't do any, well, I did some language courses because I went abroad, but that was different. That was to learn how to speak a language. So I didn't learn anything formally about linguistics, for example. I never had that plan. 
so I just kind of had to pick it up as I went along, which I've done. So maybe, you know, one doesn't have to worry too much about having a sort of a fixed end point. Just be open to lots of ideas and exploit opportunities that are there. And also be aware that, you know, you don't always get, you know, your first choice thing. There, there are opportunities out there, but there's also quite competitive. So I think having having a plan B, C and D is kind of important. If you're lucky, you get your plan A. But if you've got, you know, if you've got two or three plans, all of which would be equally good then then I think everything you know will be fine but yeah uh, so I don't know does that kind of answer your question or uh, yeah that's yeah. absolutely fantastic advice it's very reassuring like yeah have a bit of an open mind and maybe don't put your eggs in all like just one basket no. so to speak but yeah no, that's really fantastic advice very very hopeful and makes me a lot more calmer about the future and not quite knowing what to expect after my undergraduate. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, so, I mean, like I said before, you know, when I was at school, I wasn't sure I wanted to do physics and it was only, I think, in, a, in the upper sixth, I think, that I suddenly decided that, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm liking this enough that I want to stick with it. And likewise, to do a PhD, it was in my third year, it was in my year abroad when so I was in Germany learning quantum mechanics in German, which is the only way to learn quantum mechanics. But that's also where I where I got introduced to the more sort of formal theory of statistical physics and it just blew my mind at the time and that was the point where I thought, yeah, okay, that's kind of what I want to do. And I talked to so a relevant member of staff at Bristol, you know, when I was back, I said, oh, this is, these are the kind of things I'm interested in. I said, oh well you should apply to the following places. So that's another bit of advice that I would give actually is, you know, talk talk to the staff, just talk to us. Because we all, by the nature of our job, um, have either worked at or know people from lots of different places. We meet people at conferences and all the rest of it. So even if there isn't an opportunity to do what you want to do here, and in any case, often a move is, is, is a good thing, you know, we can all often talk about, you know, oh, well, that these people, yeah, no, there's a really good group that's just been set up in this place here, and they're, they're really looking for people, and they're like, like um, good people right now, you could make a really big contribution, you know, in an emerging area if you went there, and there's an opportunity there. So again, you know, we have we have this know-how, because it's all part of an international community, and kind of help you, you know, help you uh, along that path. Yeah, exactly, and I think one of the things that, especially speaking to people that I know, well they've just finished second year with me but they do find it maybe a bit intimidating to talk to professors and staff but you are right like just speaking to them because you guys know so many people you're very you know your area of research you can just help um, people along and from the professors that I've spoken to so far they're more than willing to give out all the help. Absolutely and, and hopefully we get a bit less intimidating as, as time goes on so I mean you know so I mean I guess you know fee honours is a bit kind of I hate to use the word mass market but you know what I mean that the classes are big and, uh, and you know the material is, is quite foundational so you don't get the opportunity to interact with us very much as people and as researchers so I think it's great that you're doing this this these podcasts but actually you you, you will see more of us as time goes on so in third year there's a research methods course where you will be in a smallish group with a usually a postdoc or maybe a you know, a, a younger research fellow, so someone who's right, right at the sharp end of research, learning something about, you know, a current bang up to the minute topic in, in their area and all the things that are surrounded by that. So that's a sort of the first opportunity, one of the first opportunities. And then there are the, the, the summer internship programme that we run that I talked about possibly before. And then, of course, in the honours years, there are project courses as well. And that's where you really, really get, you know, quite often people end up, particularly if you do the MPhys project, you end up sort of being embedded in one of the research groups. And then you have a, a sort of a real opportunity to to sort of get assimilated in, in into the culture if if that's what you want to do. Yeah. So so hopefully you know we can we can break down these these barriers a bit. I you know I do appreciate that. Yeah. You know I mean you know when I'm I used to teach in second year and it always used to annoy me when when students called me sir. You know because I've, I've I've not been knighted. You know and I'm not I'm not a school teacher. You know you can you can call me Richard. It's absolutely fine. You know. But you know getting to that point where you know where people feel comfortable to do that. You know it, it takes a bit of time. But hopefully, uh, but hopefully you get there in the end. Yeah, absolutely. And as you say, one of the goals or like uh, the reasons why I am doing these podcasts because it kind of does break that wall almost. It, they can be like, oh, I like that person. I'll approach them or that kind of thing. So, yeah, I, I also hope those walls are broken down and people can just maybe not 
everyone all at once but <laughs> definitely yeah, it's, it's, a bit more <laughs> it's, it's, i would say it's generally good to send an email in advance because i'm not, I'm not here every day so it's always on the i mean well done on finding my office by the way um that yeah I, I, I don't want people to waste a trip all the way down here and then just find i'm not here so but yeah but if, if anyone wants to contact me that's absolutely fine yeah, perfect and so for the very last question of the episode do you have an inspirational book slash article or a paper that you'd like to recommend uh, listeners to go out and read or that really excited you? Yeah, so it comes back a bit to, so I alluded to, you know, my time in Germany, I learned about so my first main course in statistical physics and they introduced it with something called information theory. And it's just, it's just kind of a bit unexpected that you have this, so there's a whole kind of science that actually comes out of engineering that is devoted to talking about things like you know sort of compressions you know when you have like a zip file of something and you can press down you know how much how much actual information content is there in some description of, of something and it turns out you can apply this idea to you know derive the the probability distributions in statistical mechanics because basically the idea is is that well you know we have this system of 10 to the 26 particles but actually we know thermodynamically we only need pressure volume temperature like three so there's a massive kind of compression of information going on here somewhere. And it turns out that you can formally relate the, the, the two theories and, and use one to derive things about the other and all the rest of it. So I had that, you know, my eyes were open to that at the time. So there is a paper whose title I forget, but let me just, just look it up. It touches on a sort of a more advanced um, aspect of this. So it's called Irreversibility and Heat Generation in the, in the Computing Process by Rolf Landauer and there's a thing called Landauer's Principle which comes out of it and you can google that and get a Wikipedia page which is maybe a bit more readable than the paper although the paper is actually pretty good and for me this was quite inspirational because we talked before about in the non-equilibrium case you know we don't have this this principle about everything being equally likely now when you look at it from the information theory angle what it means is that we're somehow kind of losing information like things are irreversible in some way and that can be related to a loss of information. And this paper kind of established the connection between sort of losing information and, and irreversibility in the specific context of computing. And again, and, and it was just one of these sort of eureka moments that just went, oh right, I just never realized that before, that you know, when you write a computer program, you've probably been doing some Python coding. Yeah. yeah. So if you just write a statement like x equals zero, so it sets the variable x to zero, you just think, okay, that's completely sort of virtual operation, right? But actually that that x has to be represented in the hardware of the computer somewhere. And when you set it to zero, you're erasing all memory of what its value was before. And there's no way to reconstruct that. Okay, it's gone for good. Yeah. So that's an irreversible process. But because the information has to be represented physically inside the computer, then there must be a physically irreversible process going on inside the computer. And this paper talks about that. And whenever you have an irreversible process, you have a generation of entropy, you have a uh, heat output. So even if you had like a perfectly efficient computer that had no thermal losses at all of the conventional kind like friction and stuff, the, just the mere kind of logical act of setting a variable to zero would generate heat. Okay, because that's an, you know, a logically reversible operation, but because it's logically irreversible, it has to be physically irreversible, and when something's physically irreversible, it generates heat. And so this paper was actually, for me, it was just like, well, that just kind of blew my mind and, and made me think a lot about, you know, all the theory surrounding sort of equilibrium and non-equilibrium systems and information and, and physics and all the rest of it. So yeah, so um, so if you can get through it, I think it's 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 well worth a read. Yeah, that sounds like a super interesting paper. I'm going to have to pick it up, because, especially how it seems to link different uh, processes and just how you explained it. It seems really cool. <laughs> so yeah, I'll definitely pick it up for maybe a summer read. So yeah, thank you so much again for being on this podcast and for speaking to us about your research and giving fantastic advice and for your um, paper recommendation. It's been really great having you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Delving 
into academics and I hope you found it interesting. Please like, review, comment and subscribe wherever you're listening to this. And if you want to find out more about The Researcher, I will have their university website page linked in the description. See you in two weeks for another episode.